Okay, let's uh, let's conclude today with uh, with talk by Yin Chen, uh, who's going to uncover conformal symmetry of 3D icing. Okay, so yeah, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for uh, inviting me to this uh, wonderful conference and also to Florence. So today I'm going to talk about uh, uh, some work that I'm super excited about. I hope that it will get on archive next week. So the work is collaborated with uh, Wei Zhu, who is a faculty at Westlake University and his postdoc, Chao Han. And I should say that they are the hero that did all the numeric uh, simulations that I will present uh, in this talk. And we're also working uh, together with Emily Hoffman, who is uh, sitting here, and Johannes Hoffman. Uh, they are Monte Carlo experts. We are also working on Monte Carlo simulations for a similar model. But in this talk, I will not talk about, uh, I, will I will not present Monte Carlo results. If you're interested, uh, you can catch any of us to, uh, uh, okay. So just to get the experts in the uh, audience in the room excited, let me give you an overview of our results. So what we did is that we finally managed to numerically simulate uh, 3D Eisen transitions on the sphere geometry as two times R. You know, people were dreaming to do this for decades because you can get very nice properties such as the so-called state operator correspondence that everyone should know here. And, and in particular, we say this almost a perfect state operator correspondence on incredibly small system size. That is 16 speeds. So, and uh, we have identified uh, many uh, primary operators, that is 13 parity even primary operators with scaling dimensions uh, list here. And you can say that compared with the uh, 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 conformal bootstrap as uh, results, the numerical error is incredibly small, right? We have one at 1.6% 1 or others uh, smaller than that. And uh, we also identified two uh, parity odd primaries, which were not known before. Bootstrap has not been able to access it at the moment. So those two operators. And as I emphasize that it works on incredibly small system size, 16 speeds. You might remember yesterday in Anders' talk that the largest system size he has simulated is 0.2 million speeds. So compare those two numbers and look at the results we have here, you should feel really amazed, at least I'm. So, and what make this miracle to happen Yeah, the so you mean so we yeah we, we we use just energy tensor to calibrate the results like we need to rescale the energy gaps in order to get the scaling dimensions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I will talk about this later. Yeah. So and what really makes this miracle to happen is that instead of this conventional wisdom about discretizing a manifold, the discretizing a sphere that what, what we are doing is that we falsify the sphere. So yeah, if you are not, so indeed I'm not the first person who brought up this terminology, right? On Tuesday, uh, Gabriel also mentioned this uh, father sphere thing. So it's a, if you haven't, uh, if you're not familiar with this terminology, it's actually a serious mathematical term, which refers to non-commutative sphere. And in our condensed matter language, that's actually something very familiar that we consider the physics that projected to the lowest standard level. And, and in this talk, I will also like uh, talk about uh, uh, our, our work uh, just using the language of the lowest standard level. All right, so this is the outline. I will start with a brief introduction and then talk about this spherical lambda level regularization or fuzzy sphere regularization. And then I will uh, present our numerical results, in particular, the state operator correspondence of the for this 3D ice in phase transitions. And I will uh, conclude with some outlook and discussions. Okay, so everyone in this room should, yeah, are familiar with this conformal symmetries and lattice models. And we all know that historically, the study of lattice models, like those 
classical Eisen models or the quantum Eisen models that gave the birth to the uh, idea of conformal field theories. And it all starts with this uh, famous formula, this three point correlator. And Poliakov also conjectured that 3D Eisen transitions uh, is conformal, but to the moment it's not, has not been proven yet. Okay, so, and we know that uh, for CFT, we have this nice properties, so-called state operator correspondence. And in particular, what you can consider is that you consider a quantum Hamiltonian uh, defines on the sphere, this SD minus one, and then its eigenstates will be in one-to-one -one correspondence to the CFT scaling operators that include both primary operators and descendant operators. And in particular, the energy gaps of those eigenstates will be proportional to the scaling dimensions of the CFT scaling operators with this, uh, some non-universal factors that depends on the model and the system size. Okay. And so then uh, uh, this gives us a very good way to study uh, CFTs. And for 2D CFT, it, what you need to do is very simple that you just uh, put your quantum Hamiltonian, your favorite uh, CFT on a circle, and then you calculate its energy spectrums using various methods. And from this, uh, a lot of conformal data can be extracted. I think it's something that Cardi has been proposed uh, a few decades ago. And of course, people did very nice work uh, to study those 2D CFTs on a circle. And people can, one of my favorite paper is uh, from this, is this one that on the lattice, they can even explore the Virasoro algebras. Uh, okay, so uh, it's natural to, uh, How, how do you com compute that? Well, you can only access the lowest line operators, right? You cannot access higher operators like other primary operators and so on, right? And you need to do fine size scaling. And, and here we don't do fine size scaling. Yeah, we just, so for example, the, the, the data I showed in the first page, they are just raw data without any extrapolations. Uh, sorry, you, you mean for 3D? Uh, for 3D on Horus, you don't have state operator correspondence, right? So then you don't really quite have the, uh, you cannot quite access the informations uh, regarding conformal symmetry and so on. For three stores, you don't have, it's not even conformal manifold. It's not conformally equivalent to the flat space. Yeah. You can compute some uh, critical exponent, but you cannot access in primary operators or talk about conformal symmetry. Yeah. Okay, so, uh, and uh, for, for 3 d CFT, if you want to explore the consequence of conformal symmetries, uh, you have to put it on some conformal manifold, not torus. So the, 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 the best choice will be this uh, two sphere that you consider some quantum Hamiltonian defined on two sphere, but you know that we cannot uh, put it on, a, put the lattice on two sphere because two sphere has a curvature, right? So then it's called, yeah. So you have to go with a, a, some sort of discretization where there's a lot of defects that breaks the uh, spherical rotation symmetry very badly. So that's the, really the challenge for, to uh, study higher dimensional CFTs if you are uh, using those lattices, right? Okay. So, and what the, the way out, the, uh, so the approach that we choose is to consider, to try to, as I advertised at the beginning, that we want to regularize uh, this model or any phase transitions you, on this fuzzy sphere and- so, uh, Sorry, a very naive question. Why is that much worse than the case of two dimension where even there, when you discretize, you break rotations, right? But then you recover it in the, 
yeah, in the continuum layer. It might recover in the IR, right? People have tried, but I don't think anyone has should have, have seen this state of beta correspondence numerically. Yeah, yeah you can do that. People have tried, but it doesn't quite work. Okay, so uh, the so to to consider uh, to put it on Sapphire, what we are going to do is that uh, we are uh, is this uh, lowest lambda level projection. Let me first uh, just give you uh, some brief introduction about this uh, spherical lambda level. So as you know that for for particles or electrons moving on a two D uh, plane under the magnetic field, then the energy bands of it will becomes this complete uh, uh, flat bands that are called lambda levels, it, it's quantized. And indeed you can put this lambda levels on any 2D orientable uh, manifold. And it, so for example, you can put it on sphere. And then the problem you want to consider is really just electrons moving on the surface of the sphere in the presence of a magnetic monopole. It's a single particle uh, problem that uh, described by this uh, Hamiltonian, then you can just uh, solve it. You will find that uh, the energy bands of those electrons will form this uh, complete flat lambda levels uh, labeled by this N index, and each lambda level will have this energy. And on each lambda levels is actually uh, degenerate with this number of degeneracies. And indeed, all, for each lambda level, each uh, all the states on each lambda level forms this. Uh, a spin n plus s irreducible representations of SO3. And for lowest lambda levels, uh, we will have two s plus one degeneracies. And we can label all those states using this uh, m uh, index uh, running from minus s to s. And its wave functions look like this. And it's also called monopole harmonics, which was uh, originally discussed in the seminal paper of Wu and Yang. This, uh, we are multiple uh, paper. Okay, so this is the lowest lambda level. So now we can uh, add interactions uh, to this Hamiltonian. So just uh, remind you that without interactions, we have, as I said, we have those lambda levels, and we can consider a situation that uh, I have the number of electrons is smaller than the number of states of the lowest lambda level. And then if the gap between this lowest lambda level and higher lambda levels are much larger than the interactions, uh, we can consider this so-called lowest lambda level projections. Uh, that is what typically done uh, in condensed matter uh, research about those uh, quantum hall physics. Okay, so the lowest lambda level projection is actually very straightforward that you just, just write down this uh, lowest lambda level wave functions. And for the fermion annihilation operators, you can rewrite it as this uh, second quantized form. And then the, with this, you can write down any operators. Uh, for example, this fermion density operators will be like this. So then for this type of interactions, then you just do this uh, uh, conventional uh, uh, projection, then uh, you can end up with uh, some second quantized Hamiltonian. Okay. So, uh, so in the end, the after this lowest lambda level projection, in the end, we end up with a model. Uh, it's kind of funny that uh, uh, you can view uh, view it as like a uh, fermionic uh, chain with two s plus one side, and those side will be labeled by this uh, m index from minus s to s, and then just. Remember that all those sides indeed form a spin S representations of the SO3 sphere rotation symmetry. And uh, all the Hamiltonians you want to write down uh, will be, uh, should be SO3 uh, invariant. For example, if you want to consider two body interactions, there's only one term that is allowed, that is this uh, term. And uh, the sense becomes a bit more complicated uh, if you want to consider four body interactions. And uh, so uh, for four body interactions, it will generically take uh, the form like this. And this uh, 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 
we're gonna uh, 3G symbols because we are eventually are just dealing with the representations of SO3 symmetries. And those interactions are called Haldane pseudo potentials. It's Haldane who first introduced those in the study of fractional quantum Hall state on a sphere. And pictorially, uh, you can easily understand what those four body interactions means. It actually just describes the scattering process of two fermions. Uh, so that is, you, you can consider two uh, fermions with being S, and then they scatters in this two S minus L channel to another uh, spin S uh, fermions. So, uh, so then you can know that you, you can have two S plus one independent uh, uh, interactions uh, to tune with. So that is uh, what this, uh, uh, physics or Hamiltonian on the lowest lambda level uh, should look like. Okay, so now let me introduce uh, our models. Uh, so uh, before the lambda level projections, the model that we have is something, uh, is uh, spin four electrons uh, moving on the sphere. And uh, so, uh, and those electrons are just uh, those psi, uh, uh, fermions and it's uh, so we can use this to design uh, define a density operators uh, like this. Uh, those sigma are just polymetrics. So then you can realize that the first term is actually just the continuum version of the Ising interactions, right? The U can be this U just describes the interaction profile. You can choose it uh, to be anything you, you like, and what we choose is actually it's a ultra local contact interactions on a sphere. uh it's integrated over this it's a before projection is a continuum model yeah. they're not in this it's just a, they're just a coordinate of of this and those fermion density theory yeah. so like lambda models where you have fermions in the gate in the ic models why do you have fermions in the gate uh it's not it's electromagnetic field yeah so this is what, uh, that's a Hamiltonian before the projection. It's somehow just a rewriting of the Eisen-Hamiltonian. Yeah, so we rewrite the Eisen-Hamiltonian in the continuum, and then we project it to the lowest down level. Yeah, but like, why do you have lambda? Like, what's the electric field? Uh, so one way to, uh, Think about it is that we write down some continuum Ising models and then we uh, we we put it or uh, down the fuzzy sphere or project it to the lowest number level. There's also condensed matter uh, uh, interpretations that I can tell you in a minute. Okay. Sure. Okay. Like, okay. So the naive understanding of Ising models that you take a spin, you go to the continuum limit, you have five to the fourth. So what's the relationship between well, it, uh, we're not simulating five to the fourth theory. We're just simulating uh, phase transitions that is in the same universality as the Eisen transitions. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I will talk about how to understand. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah, just just wait for a minute. Yeah. So. So you can think that as a continuum model that is Ising-like, right? And the first term you can think it is just as the Ising interactions. The second term is that it's a transverse field which will eventually disorder the, uh, this Ising uh, phase. And this is uh, the model that uh, is before the projection, then we can do this lowest lambda level projections just, uh, as what I described before. So that's uh, it's in the end, it's just a rewriting of all those Hamiltonians on the lowest down level, right? Uh, where is it? B? Oh, yeah, the, those are those density density interactions. Yeah. So for this type of ch choice of contact interactions, it turns out that we only have V1 and v V0. So this a subscript you can just think as the fermion scattering process in specific uh, angular momentum channel. Okay. So for this model, uh, if the if we don't have the 
magnetic field, this edge, then it turns out that it's ground state, it just uh, will spontaneously break these I and Z2 symmetries. Uh, so we consider a case that we have fill uh, the lowest lambda level. So then if the Z2 symmetry is spontaneously broken, I will have all those uh, spins of electrons pointing either to the plus or minus Z direction and completely fill the lambda levels. Uh, that gives gives me this so-called this icing uh, uh, symmetry breaking state, and in condensed matter literature, that 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 this state is actually called corner hole ferromagnet, which has been observed in experiments. And indeed, the most famous integer corner hole state uh, uh, deep down is uh, corner hole ferromagnet. Yeah. So, uh, and if we uh, increase the magnetic field, then we will polarize the spins uh, along to this X directions, then it will, again, completely fill the lowest standard level, giving me the Z2 disorder state. So uh, you can think uh, our models as just a, a realizations of Eisen transitions. Uh, it's a transition between this quantum hall ferromagnets that spontaneous break of Z2 symmetries and the disorder state. And this quantum hall ferromagnet has indeed be uh, observed experimentally starting from this first paper of this integer quantum hall state. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. You have a full H axis, so when H is down at two, yeah. I get better oscillations of value. It's valid, it's a different energy scale. So the, the, the gap, between lambda levels has nothing to do with those those V and H. So we can push it as large as we like. Okay, so what, what's uh, it's related to the, the strength of magnetic field and on the sphere is related to the radius of the sphere. Yeah. But it has nothing to do with those parameters here. Right. Simulation, then you will have some value for the for this for the gap, and you will really large. So you yeah, have yeah, error. yeah. Uh, so uh, in practice, we just uh, put this gap to infinity. Yeah, it's it doesn't enter in the simulation at all. Yeah, and experimentally in the quantum hall physics, it the gap is uh is related to the strength of the magnetic field, and if it is large, then the, the lowest number level projection is safe. Uh, yeah. Can I ask a question also? Uh, Slava. Uh, it's it's the the monopole flux. Uh, you can see it's uh, the magnetic field is uh, on the one hand appears in as the the monopole uh, flux is also related to the radius of the the, the sphere. Uh, sorry? This one? Uh, the, 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 the monopole flux appears in the, uh, in the, this, uh, interactions. This S is a monopole flux. So your whole is coming on if you differ with the magnetic component. Yeah, 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 yeah. My full Hamiltonian is like this. Uh, like uh, like this, and this uh, R is an independent parameter. The the electron mass is also independent that uh, parameter. I can choose arbitrarily. I can choose it as small as large as I wish. Has nothing to do with the interactions. So that's why the the lowest lambda level projections are uh, is valid because the gap is. Is like this, right? So I can so I can make the gap as large as possible. Can you make some argument that this transition is really in the universality class of the local easing model? Because one can be worried that uh, reduction to the Lando level makes the theory non-local. Uh, not not really. You can imagine a situation that let's say we we are just doing experiments. That uh, of this quantum hall ferromagnetism, uh, we have first of all, it's a local model before lambda lo lowest lambda level projection, right? And then I I increase the magnetic field, right? Uh, 
it won't change the universality, right? So then you can just pretend that you are not doing this lowest standard level projection, right? You, you can always simulate the full model or do the experiment. It, in experiments, people are, you, you don't have those lowest standard level projection, right? What I'm worried about is this, like if I, if I forget about the origin of your model uh, and I just think in terms of those coefficients, CM, uh, those creation and relation operators that you introduced and I have some representation of, of the rotation symmetry, I can cook up a gazillion other models which will also have exact rotation invariance, but presumably most of those models will not be local. And so the transitions in those models are not going to be in the using universality class. So there has to be some miracle in the coefficients that you're going to put into your simulations, which guarantee locality. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. It's it's actually uh, unclear to me that if I just uh, start with a Hamiltonian on the lowest number level, how, how do I know whether this model is local or not? That's true. And in our uh, case, we, we know what we are doing because we know what's the Hamiltonian before the lowest number level projection. It's a local Hamiltonian, right? And then you can just pretend that uh, you are always simulating the model without doing the lowest number level projection. That then you know that that model is uh, is local, right? And and should be equivalent to the and in practice the the, the solution of that model without projection should be uh, same as the one with projection. All right. So uh, this is the model, and as I said, uh, we have this phase transitions between a phase spontaneous break Z2 symmetries and a phase without breaking Z2 symmetries. And this isenferromagnet has indeed been observed in experiments for a few decades. Okay, so I, I should mention that a similar model has been studied on fuzzy torus or lambda levels on torus, and they were. The, the reason they, they studied was for different motivations, but that's kind of inspired us to consider uh, this uh, Eisen transitions uh, on Sophia. Okay, so now let me uh, jump to the, uh, the, the, the main part of this talk, that is the numerical results, in particular, this data operator correspondence of the 3D Eisen model. Let me just uh, First, uh, analyze analyze the symmetries and all the parameters of the uh, of this model. So, in practice, in the end, the model we are simulating is we can think it as two s plus one uh, fermionic chain, and we consider spin four electrons uh, moving in this chain, and the fermions are at half filling, and uh, this n will be the fermion electron numbers and so I should emphasize that this n should be considered as a space volume. And in other words, if you want to consider, uh, convert to the ordinary quantum lattice Hamiltonian simulation, this n should be Lx square or L square. So, uh, and in the UV model, we have a number of symmetries. First is that we do have this Eisen symmetries. Uh, and it's natural to expect this Eisen symmetry will become the same Eisen symmetry uh, uh, in the IR of these Eisen transitions. And we have this SO3 uh, sphere rotation symmetries. Uh, and as I said, it's a very funny uh, model that all the lattice sites form uh, spin S representations of SO3. And, uh, it's, and this SO3 uh, rotation symmetries will become the SO3 Rollins symmetry of the uh, IRCFT. And we have uh, particle hole symmetries uh, acting like this because we are at half filling of the system. And this particle hole symmetry turns out to be the space time parity symmetry. It's not that obvious to say that, but uh, uh, please trust me, that's, that's what happened. And I'm happy to explain afterwards. Okay. And so with those, then we can easily write down the order parameters for the uh, for this Eisen transitions, it's really just uh, the uh, SZ uh, ma uh, magnetic moment of this uh, model. Okay, so this is the symmetries and the uh, models. Now, 
what we want to do is that we want to identify the phase transitions by doing this uh, conventional fine size scaling. And here, what we choose is to the, do the fine size scaling of the order parameters, right? And we know that for order the phase, we will have this uh, uh, scaling uh, relation. And at phase transitions, we'll have this uh, scaling relations. And the third high is just the scaling dimensions of this uh, Fermilion uh, uh, icing order parameter. Then we just uh, calculate this M square and rescale it. And then we find the curve. We, we input that. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, go ahead. Okay. So, in order to get a result, that's the one thing you have to input. Uh, we, we want to find the identify the phase transition point, right? You can do more conventional thing like those bin, using binder ratios and so on to the fine size scaling. Yeah. Here, the, the purpose of our work is to say whether we have state of the correspondence, in other words, conformal symmetry at this transition. So we, we're not, so that's why we, we just input this and to, to say where is the phase transition. Yeah. As you may realize that the system size we have here is very small and limited. So then, yeah, we, we want to input something rather than do the more sophisticated analysis. We, we can also do that. Just no. uh, all right. So you say that the those curves nicely cross, and even if you zoom in, that you say that they, they still cross very almost perfectly at the same point. And this cross this nice crossing even start with eight electrons, or in other words, eight spins, right? That's like three by three lattice. H is a transverse field strength. Yeah. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, no, the one percent error is sixteen spins. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, we cannot uh, compute uh, twenty-two spin. We cannot compute the energy spectrum of the twenty-two spins. Uh, for energy spectrum, we use exact diagonalization. We, so far, we can only go to 16 spins, but we can use other method that called DMRG that to compute the ground state of the Hamiltonian. And with ground state, we can already compute this M square. Right? Yeah, what's the significance of this overlap of H uh, That is uh, where the, you should expect for the phase transition, right? But usually the, only if the system size is very large, the, the curves of different uh, size will cross at the same point. For small size, you, sh you should expect uh, a fine size corrections, then you don't say the nice crossing. What's the significance of the fact that the y is 22? Uh, that is not significant. That, that's non-universal. Yeah, that's model dependent, in other words. But the... So you are to determine the result of this yeah, yeah. We can also do binder ratio, and I can I can show it later. The binder ratio is not as good as this order parameter. That I think Monte Carlo people know that binder ratio has much larger fluctuations and so on. For Monte Carlo simulations, if you do maybe L equals one hundred and so on, maybe you, you still don't say nice crossing of binder ratio, right? So, but I don't know. For Monte Carlo like simulations of lattice icing models, uh, if you do this M square crossing, uh, starting from which system size, you will see this like perfect crossing. But for us, it's really like eight spins. Okay, so this uh, then we identify the where the phase transition is. Then we just use exact diagonalizations to calculate the energy spectrums at the phase transitions. So. And just remind you that uh, the energy gaps of those excited state will be proportional to the scaling dimensions of the uh, icing CFTs. And this is state of operator correspondence, which is a consequence of conformal symmetry. In other words, if we see this, then we find direct evidence for the emergent conformal symmetry of the 3D icing transitions. So uh, uh, we get energy gaps from those uh, uh, exact diagonalization, then we rescale the energy gap because there is a non-universal uh, 
prefactor depends on the model and the system size. And then the way that we uh, scale it just uh, by saying that I require my system to have energy moment and tensor, whose scaling dimension is three with angular with uh, Rowland spin two and Z2 singlet, right? So we find that operator, then we rescale it. And then, the, uh, then we get a rescaled energy gap. Then those energy gaps will be the scaling dimensions of the operators in SFT, including both primary operators and descendant operators. Remember that in the model, we have exact Z2 symmetry, SO3, Lorentz rotation, and, party, and parity symmetry. Then we can just look for each quantum number in those three. We can just uh, enumerate all the operators that we should expect from the CFT side, then compare it with the rescale gaps uh, from our ED calculations. For example, if you look at this Z2 odd parity even L equal to zero uh, sector, the, from CFT side, the operators will be like this from low dimensions to high dimensions. And the rescale gaps uh, from 16 spins are like this, then we just say that in our numerical data, this sigma has scaling dimension 0.524, and this descendant have this uh, 0.2517 and so on. That's how we read out all the uh, operators uh, get their scaling dimensions for both primary and descendant operators. Okay. You already say that the, the difference between those, the first two are almost uh, close to two, which is what you should expect from the uh, conformal symmetry. So now uh, from this, we can identify, we can just identify all the operators that we have in the ED calculations, then try to say that whether we get this state operator correspondence, uh, we can look at this. Uh, uh, so as you know, for each primary operators, we will have this descendant, uh, for scalar operators, its descendant will be like this. So then we can just match this with our numerical data. Here, uh, I plot the uh, conformal multiplet of uh, sigma. And those lines are just what uh, we expect based on the bootstrap results. And those symbols are our numerical data. You'll see that the agreement is, in, is unexpectedly uh, high. And there, there's some small, uh, there's some larger discrepancies if the scaling dimensions are large, this is kind of what you kind of expected, right? And even if, and even there, uh, if you just uh, calculate the relative error of the scaling dimensions is actually still very small, like 3% and so on. Yeah, and uh, you can say for both the uh, multiple of sigma and epsilon, uh, the, the, the agreement is really high. And we can also uh, consider the conformal multiplet of uh, uh, spinning operators. So for spinning operators, the situation is slightly more complicated. For example, uh, we can have those parity odd uh, descendant uh, right like this. And we also know that uh, we have this energy momentum tensor, which is conserved which means that it won't have any descendant whose spin is smaller than two. And this again agrees with our numerical data. Here is what we have for this uh, multiple of energy moment tensor. You say it's empty here, correspond to that uh, it's conserved, right? And for some, uh, and we also, here I also plot the multiple of this spin two uh, Z2 order operator. Again, the agreement is good. And you, you may say this uh, uh, green uh, line or the square symbol that are the parity order operators. Again, this matches. And we also capture the degeneracies of the multiple as well. So everything works. Okay, so let me just uh, recap what we have. So we are just using this exact diagonalization on 16 spins. Question? So for instance, uh, yeah. you, you don't find any, uh, any, any state between sigma and sigma prime as you expect from the equation of motion. It's, uh, it's, no. There's literally nothing. Nothing, nothing. Yeah. yeah. So, so another question, sorry. Here, every descendant can, counts as um, an independent state, right? 
yeah, yeah. Is there a way to, I don't know, diagonalize already in the conformal multiplets? Uh, sorry? Is there a way to force that stays within the, within the same multiplet comes together instead of having uh, to reconstruct There them? might be a way. We haven't done so. Yeah, we, the, the difficulty is, first of all, we know that the fine size correction there will be large, right? Will be larger, right? And secondly, we know that the degeneracy is very high. It actually goes exponentially with the scaling dimension. Then you have to, you know, it's, then it's very hard to identify them, right? Yeah. Uh, because that's, that's the calibrator we use to rescale all the energy gaps. Yeah. Right. Because there's a universe, non universal prefactor for this relation. Right. Yeah. Uh, I don't know what does it mean by fuzzy the interactions. So, but if you put it on a if you discretize the sphere, then you know it breaks the SO3 symmetry pretty badly. You may you may hope that it's recovered uh, if in the thermal dynamic limit, but it is probably that requires very huge system size. People have tried, but doesn't really say much anything of this uh, state of correspondence. No, rotation symmetry is not recovered in thermal dynamic limit because for the easy model, there is a relevant scalar, which is going to appear with the next dependent coefficient. So you will never get the critical point. Thanks. So does this answer your question? Okay, so yeah, yeah. How do you remove, or how do you know that there are no descendants uh, from operations with the same regular form? Uh, it just, uh, yeah. So, okay. What we did is that, let's say, we just, uh, from ED, we get the energy spectrum, and we tell us that, let's just look at operators, states whose spin is smaller than five, right? Then we get those states, and then we enumerate all the uh, states operators just for using conformal bootstrap data, right? So then uh, all those states should be contained in those, let's say, seventy low light state. There may be some other state that is not uh, from the the operators that we enumerated, and those operators will be what you are asking about. But it turns out that it just there's none such operator. There's none such states in our data, right? There are no, there are no states being four descendants of the five operators. They will have higher scaling dimensions than the operators we are looking at. Let me put it that way. If uh, are, you, it, you can, uh, can, 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 how, how do these numbers compare if you have less than 16 spins? And does it systematically like reduce as you increase the number of spins, spins from like say eight to sixteen? Uh, you mean the adder? Yeah. Uh, I, I will uh, show it maybe later. It it doesn't. It, the the change is kind of non monotonic. Non monotonic. Yeah. But it, it in general it uh, the adder decreases as the system size goes large. Right. I, I have a plot later. Yeah. So, uh, okay, uh, in total, we have identified, uh, as I said, 15 primary operators uh, as listed here. Two of them are parity order operators whose scaling dimension are still unknown from bootstrap. And as you may know that those operators are pretty high. And here we give uh, a first estimate for those, uh, for those two parity order primary operators. And for the parity even primary operators, uh, we can just compare it with the bootstrap calculations and the numerical error is incredibly small. Yeah, and remember that it's a data from 16 spins. Okay. So how do you know your parity other operators are not dependent? Good question that 
Yeah, there's a way to know it, but it's it's a bit technical. I can tell you later. Yeah, it's just that it turns out for scalar operator, it's very easy to do so. So that's why we only try to identify two. There may be more that we can identify, but I feel it's rather complicated to do so. So then I decided not. <laughs> yeah. For it, for higher spin, that's a spin one or spin two uh, uh, parity order operators, then it's totally a mess to identify the primary operators. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe I can give you one short sentence to explain why. Remember that for those uh, descendant of the spinning operators, it actually has parity order descendant, right? But all those parity order descendant uh, cannot be scalar. That's the reason. So, yeah. Uh, this yeah, yeah, I, I, I think so. Yeah. What about descendant of parity or spinning? Yeah, good question. We can we can exclude that. Yeah, by do, doing more careful analysis. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we can we can chat offline. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so uh, as I explained, uh, we we just look at let's say seventy lowest line state, and it turns out that all of them just matches with bootstrap results with no with neither extra state or missing state. Yeah, just perfect match. That makes our life easier. That we don't need to speculate that there's some other primaries or some descendant from some unknown primaries. But by the way, there is a bound on the on the dimension of this on the smallest parity odds single from the stress tensor bootstrap and more or less that number. You mean for this? For the parity odds. Yeah, scale. yeah, yeah. I checked it's consistent, right? Yeah. The the, the bound should be like smaller than uh eleven point one or point two ish. Yeah. And here the, the, the value we have is, is ten, is around ten. All right, so uh, we also we can also calculate the OPE coefficient. It's uh, rather preliminary, uh, and I only did this for fourteen spins. And you say the agreement uh, again pretty high, right? And we also can also calculate some OPE coefficient that has not been computed using conformal bootstrap. Sorry, how do you compute OPE coefficient? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so indeed, people did this for 2D CFTs on uh, lattice. So basically, you consider some expectation values of an operator uh, and the bra and the cat are some, the state corresponding to the, the, the primary operators, things like that. These are some metric elements. Is there some metrics element we can compute? I think uh, it was maybe first down for 2D safety, it was done by uh, Gifford Vidal and his student, Yi Jian Zhou. Yeah. No, but I guess the puzzle is you can use as Brian Cat the, the states from the exact visualization, that's clear, but what do you put as an operator in the middle? Yeah, we, we just choose an operator that has find overlap with this and do a scaling data extrapolation. That's that's a part I don't like, but but that's basically limits your ability to to the first operator uh, in the in the given symmetry class. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that's is why it's still preliminary. I I hope to get more a better way to compute it. Right. So. Yeah. Yeah. In our preprint next week, we won't have this. OP in the paper. Yeah. Okay. So okay, now let me uh, just uh, go to the last section that I will. Sorry, can I ask you the time yeah. scale of of the computation? Okay. So uh, initially, for sixteen spins, it's like two days to get those data, but now we optimize the code is like six hours maybe. But but you know for ED just like this for small size you can compute it very quickly but it, you you will easily hit the exponential wall right for Monte Carlo it's always a polynomial game so it's it's kind of different. Ah, uh, I I don't remember number. Yeah.
Okay. Both. Depends on which hardware you are using. Uh, if you use those fancy ones like GPU or even TPU, then the bottleneck is memory. Oh, but you know, everything goes exponentially. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So, uh, I, I believe in this community, uh, no one will be surprised that Ising is uh, conformal, right? 3D Ising is conformal. But it's nice to have that, to, to, to observe direct evidence uh, for this uh, emergent conformal symmetry. And I think most mysterious thing to me uh, is that why it works so well in our system, right? So I show data for 16 spins, and it even works if I just have eight spins. Just imagine how crazy that is, right? Eight spins, then you can get information about Isen's FTs. Like here, I list the, the primary operators and descendants that we get from eight spins. You see the numerical address is still pretty high, right? And accidentally, it's even better than 16 spins. So, so yeah, why it works so well? I, I don't think, I, I don't have a clear answer yet. And here I, I also show another plot that is the, just how those scaling dimensions of those primaries we have identified, how does it depends on the system size. You see the value is more this doesn't quite change, right? Uh, so, uh, and uh, I think a really, interesting question to ask is why it works well so well and what's special here right uh maybe just because 3d ice and safety is simple right but it won't be that simple right we know it's not integrable right so maybe it's the uh yeah so uh and we are doing sphere uh, we are doing the we define the model on the sphere, so then you know sphere has this, uh, and we have the exact SO3 symmetry. In terms of RG flow, we know that this uh, SO3 symmetry may forbid a lot of relevant operators, uh, irrelevant operators. You know, the fine size scaling, the fine size effect is partly caused by the uh, irrelevant operators. So the more you forbid, or the, the more you, you fine tunes, it will make it flows to IR faster. But I don't think that that could explain why it works so well. And I think secretly, which I don't really understand, is that this fuzzy sphere thing is the, is the key here. And I, as I said, I don't really understand. And one thing I can kind of imagine is that on this fuzzy sphere, uh, the thermodynamic limit is equal to continuum limit. We, it, we kind of start with a continuum. We don't have lattice spacing to start with. Uh, so that may be one reason that it works so well, but as I said, uh, it really requires us to uh, think more hard, think harder about what is really happening here. And I think that's also a, a very great opportunity for us to tackle various of 3D CFTs uh, numerically, right? So indeed, a zoom of uh, 3D CFTs can be studied this way. Uh, I showed icing, and we can easily do this O2 and uh, not easily, it's just, we, we, can, we can still do the O2 and O3 Wilson feature, where it's a bit more complicated setup. And we can also simulate some non-linear signal models with West Zumino written term. That's actually the in, original motivation for, uh, for Mike Zarato, Fakhar Saad, and uh, the company to think about this London level regularizations of uh, uh, fish additions. But what they did is on uh, Taurus, okay. And one model we can have is QCD3 with fermions coupled to SU2 gauge field. And in particular, this SO5 de deconfined fractionization below. Uh, we, we need to identify where the phase transition is. There are various ways to do that. One is look at the binder ratio. We can, we can do that and yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just for I think we know a lot about it, and that that and then we just t tell us that let's do make it simple, right? We identify where fit transition is, and then say whether look at to check whether there's emergent conformal symmetry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, 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 I think so. Yeah, it's all like those. Yeah, one way to realize is to just think about some strong interacting model corresponding to those nonlinear signal models with which you know, term. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. So one way to do is really just a scan the phase diagram and then find the energy moment and tensor, rescale it to say whether we get conformal state operator correspondence. And if we get that, then there's a good reason to believe that's just a phase transition point we want to look for, right? Yeah. Well, you can also require, well, okay. Yeah, there are various ways to, to, to do it, right? It's just here, we, we, at the moment, we just uh, choose the simplest way. Yeah. With a little input. Okay. And hopefully I can find a way to do QD3, right? That's the, this theory I hope to tackle. And uh, we may also be able to do this so-called stiffle liquid that uh, Chong, Liu Jinzhou and I proposed as some non-Lagrangian CFTs in 3D. Uh, it's related to this nonlinear signal models. That's why I think it's promising. And probably we can also do gross no Yukawa, right? Yeah. And on the other hand, uh, this model is actually quite uh, amenable to various numerical methods, right? We can, what I showed is exact diagonalization, right? We also did some DMRG like that. Uh, for that, we can also do the determinant of Monkalo, right? I mean, for other models, we know that those exact diagonalization and DMRG is not on the table for 3D fractionations. You can say this from uh, Martin's uh, talk yesterday that he listed a number of methods without those two, right? Yeah. So now it's an opportunity that those two methods now, the most, I, I think the, the those two very powerful numerical methods that we condensed matter people are using uh, uh, a lot now is able to, I mean, we can use them to study uh, 3D fractionation, 3D CFTs, right? And those two methods has its really uh, advant uh, own advantage. For example, we can calculate a lot of excited state, which is very important to understand safety spectrum, right? Those state operator correspondence to get to the primary operators. And also those two methods give us direct access to the ground state wave functions, right? Then using those wave functions, we can ask a lot of interesting questions, right? For Monte Carlo, you, for the most time you calculate observables uh, by some statistical sampling, right? So those two methods can give us anything that we want as long as we can reach the, the, the right system size. Okay, so uh, I uh, let me say a bit, little bit about fuzzy sphere that I had it in my title and I brought up uh, it uh, uh, very early about uh, this uh, fuzzy sphere thing. So, so uh, we know that the indeed the lowest Landau level projection that we are doing uh, is related can be equivalently uh, thought as that you consider some models defines on the fuzzy sphere. So uh, the way to say this is that remember that we start with this uh, electrons moving under the magnetic monopole. Then uh, you can define some so. Uh, this lambda is just the canonical angular momentum. X is the uh, uh, coordinate on the sphere. So then you can define this uh, capital L, L, which satisfies this SO3 commutation relations. Right? And the projecting to lambda levels means that, uh, so we'll actually have those uh, covariant angular momentum gets quenched. Uh, in our, the reason is because the lambda level is completely flat. So you don't have any kinetic energy if you just are staying at the lowest lambda level, right? So then you say this, this L will just get locks. So uh, this L will get locked with the coordinate, in other words, then the coordinates of the uh, electrons will not commuting anymore. That's why we end up with a non-commuting uh, sphere, or in other words, the fuzzy sphere. 
and the states on the for the lowest lambda level orbitals can is indeed correspond to the states you can define on the fuzzy sphere. So if you're interested in how those things work, you can check some maybe nice papers, for example, uh, here. And but uh, that that is a dictionary, but uh, it's unclear to me that. If, if you you force me to not use in this lambda level projections, how do I really falsify a model or theory on this fuzzy sphere? I have no idea about how to do. And I think it will be nice to have a systematic way to falsify a model or a theory such that we can make give us more access to different type of theories, CFTs that we are interested in, not, not rely on those lowest lambda level language. Okay, so uh, that's my last slide. So uh, what we are doing might remind you about this non-commutative field theory, right? Uh, non-commutative field theory is some field theory that's studied by string uh, theorists. Uh, and it's a theory, field theory defined on a fuzzy manifold. And uh, as you may know that it suffers this so-called UV IR mixing that the UV non-commutativity will enters in the IR properties. So then it's natural to ask, since we are studying a model uh, defined on a fuzzy manifold, do we also have this uh, UV IR mixing? And I think the answer uh, is no. And it's, uh, th there's a simple argument why uh, we don't have UV IR mixing. Let's remember that the, the fuzziness really comes from this magnetic monopole. Due to the magnetic monopole, then we have those uh, angular moment and canonical angular moment not commuting, right? The electrons are indeed are saying this fuzzy sphere because electrons are saying the magnetic monopole, right? But the Ising degree freedom, that's what goes through the phase transitions, uh, is this particle hole pair, right? Right, like this. So you say it doesn't carry electronic charge, so it won't say the monopole, so then, there's nothing fuzzy about it. So it actually says a normal sphere. So that's, I think that's also one key uh, that why it works so well. But again, I, I, I don't have a full understanding what is happening. Okay, so let me just wrap up. So we have simulated 3D icing transitions on a sphere. And for the first time we say there's almost perfect state operator correspondence on an incredibly small system size. And we have identified 13 parity even primary orbiters, and all of them agrees with bootstrap with a small adder, right? And we have find two uh, new parity odd primary operators, and which those that were uh, not known before. And I think future study will be devoted to like to explore other phase transitions and also a systematic work, uh, framework to about how do we falsify a model of theory. So yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Yes, question. I have uh, two questions. Um, firstly, so I guess the advantage of your approach is that you preserve continuous global symmetries. Yeah. Um, and so you could do supersymmetric theories in 3D in particular, like, uh, so I mean, Eventually, holographic theories. Would yeah, that be possible? Maybe, do you think? Yeah, maybe. I, I think for that to for that we need to really have a systematic framework to falsify that theory. Sorry, I mean, but you you said you thought it's reasonable to do QCD three. That is uh, some. Uh, it, we are not simul for that. We are not simul we We're still simulating universality, not the UV Lagrangian. It's just like we know some strongly interacting model, which in the IR will flow to the QCD3. Oh, oh, I see. You're not doing the specific thing. Yeah, so yeah, I see. Yeah. Um, um, also, like, could you do your method in four dimensions? Yeah, I think so. But uh, I guess the question is like, you, yeah, is there you any choose, theories? Choose which, the fuzzy you know. manifold. <laughs> not, not to, yeah, yeah. You need to. I mean, do you, do you have, I don't you, know, if you you, have, you, have you thought have about S3 and then consider. Fuzzy three sphere, that's it. Yeah, something like that. Sure, I understood. Uh, have you exactly?
Uh, so I, I didn't write it the explicit form because it's rather complicated and funny looking. So uh, it's basically something like this. Uh, we have these two body interactions uh, correspond to this transverse field. And we have four body interactions, uh, which like this. Okay. <laughs> yeah, you have three GS symbols of those. And it's in the this one, 1D fermionic chain is kind of non-local, right? but mm. you know, it should be non-local in this 1D chain. Right? That's, oh. yeah. And then we have this free parameters, this VL to choose. Yeah. Okay, thanks. So you were saying you, uh, you might be able to do O3 in the future. Uh, in this case, I, I would imagine the Hilbert space would also grow quickly as you increase delta, uh, because because simply you have two bosons, two two scalar fields instead of three, uh, three uh, two scalar fields or three scalar fields instead of a single one. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, uh, how much does that limit your diagonalization? Or uh, we, yeah. yeah, that's something we need to explore. Yeah, but I think for ultra three, we can still handle it. Uh -huh. Yeah, but you know, eventually, you know, for for such model, Monte Carlo works. So. I would say, yeah, for Monte Carlo, it's always a polynomial game. Right? So the I thing see. is, yeah. yeah, but maybe for Monte Carlo, we cannot get as much information as from the DMRG or ED, but still, we can learn a lot. Can you do any Wilson fish uh, fixed point? Like, uh, is there some obstruction to discrete subgroups or something like this? Yeah, that's related to what Jun Chen is asked. Let's say if you consider Owen Wilson Fisher, then the the size of Hilbert space should be depends on it, right? The larger it is, the, then you have much larger as Hilbert right, space. But, uh, so yeah. then, if you want to consider large n, then the the ED and DMRG is probably not on the table, but for Monte Carlo, there should be some uh, simple way to get around of this uh, growing Hilbert space. So there's no obstruction by there's the fact no that the symmetry is not continuous. Can I ask a question? Can we go to the page with the face diagram? Yeah. Like where, where the paper by Zalitel and others. This one. Yeah. So in your simulations, do you work at some particular value of V1 over V0? Yeah, exactly. We work at perfect, uh, some particular value. We, we, we kind of fine tune along this uh, phase transition line to find the best uh, data for the state operator correspondence. In other words, that's, that's like a fine tuning some irrelevant operators away, right? But, that, that, but this explains why you have such a great agreement. So th this is like in simulations of uh, Hasenbusch, where he finds a point where the epsilon prime operator has a zero coefficient, and then the corrections to scaling are due to the next irrelevant operator, which is even higher up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. But the, that, that, yeah, explains, that, that explains, if you do also a double tuning, then this explains why you have such a great agreement for small system sizes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So. You also, Hasenbusch also Hasenbusch doesn't have such huge system sizes, larger than yours, but yeah. so he can create great yeah. results in a, in a situation where he doesn't have exact rotational variance on the torus with system sizes. I don't remember like uh, yeah. 20, 20 cube. Uh, I, I think in the normal. That, I mean, in the conventional uh, models, those lattice models, no matter how much, how hard you are fine tuning, it's very hard to get precise exponents with 16 spins, right? Yeah. So here, I think some, some very special is happening here, which- But I what think. else can, uh, is just, yeah. Uh... Well, I think the, whole, the, the following question has to be addressed. You have a you you find you by doing this double fine tuning you fine tune the coefficient of epsilon prime to zero in the infrared. The coefficient of, of epsilon double prime is non-zero. Well, it's something, 
So now you just have to add, you have to do a conformal perturbation theory and ask the question, how does adding epsilon double prime to the action perturbs your spectrum? It perturbs yeah. it a little bit, but maybe not too much because epsilon double prime has a high dimension. It has a peak coefficients are not as large as those of epsilon prime. So, but you can estimate this by conformal perturbation theory. Yeah, 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 exactly. That's something we plan to do in the future. Okay, okay. Anyway, it explains, I think part of the, this double fine tuning, it explains part of the mystery. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, can I ask, uh, so about these higher dimensional things for the fuzzy sphere, you replace functions on the sphere by n by n matrices. And indeed, when you let n to infinity, this algebra approaches the algebra functions on the sphere in a very precise sense. But for this is a two, di two dimensional statement actually. So if you go to three dimensions, uh, you would still, I mean, the fuzzy, the fuzzy space would still be n by n matrices. So how do you expect to, to still approximate the 3D space by such an algebra? Sorry, I'm not sure if I understand your question. Um, 